Well, we won't be spoil sports. If this is your pleasure, Father, we'll indulge you. Our Twilight Zone Marathon and Reviews continues. Today we'll be checking out another fan favorite, a fascinating psychological horror story, The Masks. This was episode 25 from season 5. The Masks was written by Rod Serling, and it's another shining example of Serling at his best. It was directed by Ida Lupino. Now, Ida Lupino was the only woman to direct a classic episode of The Twilight Zone. You may recall, she even appeared in an earlier episode, The 16mm Shrine. So Ida contributed to the fifth dimension both in front of and behind the camera. As always, spoils are ahead. Mr. Jason Foster, a tired ancient who on this particular Mardi Gras evening will leave the earth. But before departing, he has some things to do, some services to perform, some debts to pay, and some justice to mete out. This is New Orleans Mardi Gras time. It is also the Twilight Zone. This episode has a unique but oddly fitting setting. The backdrop is Mardi Gras. Of course, no one in this story will be having any good times. At the top of the episode, we meet a wealthy old man who's at death's doorstep, Jason Foster, as played extremely well by Robert Keith. In short time, we're introduced to Mr. Foster's family, and it's firmly established that it's not so much death that has Jason Foster agitated, it's his family, the Harpers. Now these are an unlikable cutthroat bunch, but Jason Foster certainly doesn't hold back. He lets every single one of them know exactly what he thinks of them. You are the four most changeless people on this earth. On the surface, they're gathered to bid farewell to their dying loved one. But in actuality, they're just in town to ensure they get every single penny of their inheritance. We really only get broad characterizations of the family, but that's all that's required for the purposes of this story. First up, there's Mr. Foster's hypochondriac daughter, Emily Harper. This character is like nails on a chalkboard. Emily's constant whining about her non-existent illness basically makes a mockery of the fact that Jason Foster truly is about to die. Then there's Wilfred Harper. He's a cliche, phony, overly greedy businessman. There's a slimeball son named Wilfred Jr. It's noted that he once had a thing for torturing small animals. And lastly, there's Paula. She's a narcissistic, empty shell who probably wouldn't be able to pull herself away from a mirror if the house was on fire. Following dinner, the family gathers in a study, and it's here that things get very interesting. Mr. Foster insists each family member has to wear a special mask until midnight. I'm told that in addition to their artistic value, they have certain, uh, certain properties. Mr. Foster also notes everyone will receive a mask that reflects the opposite of the wearer. But since he's being sarcastic, they all receive masks that completely reflect their inner ugliness. Jason Foster's mask is a bit different, it's the face of death, which he cleverly claims is the opposite because at present he's alive. Predictably, nobody wants to wear the masks, especially Paula. No way she's covering that pretty face. But once Mr. Forster explains, if they don't wear the masks, they're not getting any inheritance. They strap them on pretty fast. However, it doesn't take very long for them to start moaning and groaning as they beg to remove the masks, claiming they're unbearable. By this point, Jason Forster is very close to death. Once Mr. Foster is gone, his family gathers to mourn. Or so you'd think. At long last, he's dead. Good. Now, let's celebrate. <laughs> Their joy doesn't last very long. They soon discovered, to their horror, that their faces had mutated into the hideous features of their masks. Recall at the beginning of the episode, Mr. Foster was noticeably agitated. However, after finally passing away, his doctor notes, this must be death. No horror, no fear, nothing but peace. Mardi Gras incident. The Dramatis Personae being four people who came to celebrate. And in a sense, let themselves go. This they did with a vengeance. They now wear the faces of all that was inside them. And they'll wear them for the rest of their lives. Said lives now to be spent in shadow. Tonight's tale of men, the macabre, and masks on the Twilight Zone. 
this was obviously another great episode, but I think it's interesting to consider that if a Twilight Zone story centered around masks were made today, given the state of the world, it's safe to say there would be some very different interpretations. But when this episode originally aired back in 1964, it was a different time. More to the point, this story was set in New Orleans, Mardi Gras time. Now on that topic, I wanted to mention Rod Serling could have established this story anywhere, but he chose New Orleans, Mardi Gras time. And I think he did so in the interest of putting a Twilight Zone spin on some of the traditions associated with the celebration. For example, Mardi Gras is French for Fat Tuesday. It's considered the last night to go all out and feast. For Christians, this occurs prior to the ritual Lenten sacrifices where fasting takes place. In this episode, Mr. Foster insists that his family have a meal before their very interesting evening. Mardi Gras is also viewed by Christians as a celebration of life, before Ash Wednesday. But in this tale, that theme is subverted. The Harpers don't celebrate life. Quite the contrary, they literally celebrate death. They're ecstatic at the passing of their patriarch. And lastly, there's the most obvious Mardi Gras reference, which involves wearing masks. Now historically, Mardi Gras masks were worn to allow people the freedom to be whoever they wanted, and to mingle with those outside of their class. However, in this tale, the mask wearers were coerced into putting the mask on. And instead of the freedom of hypocritically continuing to hide their ugliness, they're forced to face who they really are deep down. I should also mention the reactions of horror to their distorted faces, and that speaks volumes. Your caricatures, all of you, without your masks, your caricatures. The Harper family were awful. They're the opposite of what any family should be. Instead of love, understanding, and support, they're just a cold, calculating, greedy mess. But when finally confronted with the ugly truth of who they were, this once bold and brash family was reduced to silence. The entire cast here was very strong, with everyone fully embodying these tarnished souls. Robert Keith was definitely a standout. His performance ranks right up there with the greats in the series. For me, the highlights in this episode were Jason Foster just roasting his family. He hits each of them where it hurts, round after round. Each venomous jab Jason launches at his family has done so with precision. Why must you always say such miserable, cruel things to me? Because none of you respond to love. Emily responds only to what her petty hungers dictate. Wilfred responds only to things that have weight and bulk and value. Paula there lives in a mirror. The world is nothing to her but a reflection of herself and her brother. Humanity to him is a small animal caught in a trap to be tormented. Rod Serling was a legendary writer, but one thing he doesn't get enough credit for is how biting and clever his dialogue tended to be whenever characters were hurling insults at each other. You get the vibe that in the past, Mr. Foster probably didn't hold his tongue with anyone, let alone these people. But once he was at death's door, we watched this tired, sickly, weary man blast away at his family. He isn't simply roasting them for the heck of it. They've earned this. Mr. Foster is doling out harsh truths, and you can bet these pampered individuals are not likely used to hearing this from anyone, and it's hard to feel that bad for them once the full story has been told. I also have to credit Ayla Lupino's direction, not only in the shocking conclusion, but throughout the episode. She captured so much raw emotion. She also made great use of the setting. Despite the fact that this is a vast, wealthy estate, there's still a claustrophobic feeling throughout. There's a sense of being trapped with these unpleasant people until a bitter end. And speaking of the end, in terms of twists, this was another clever one. The dramatic reveal was very effective. Up until the conclusion, we're pretty much in grounded territory. Once the supernatural comes into play, there's an eerie realization that all along, this was the unique punishment Jason Foster had in mind. The makeup work was top-notch and left a disturbing impression. No pun intended. Well, yeah, maybe it's intended. If this story seems uncomfortable to some, I get that. The episode features examples of humanity at its lowest. There's greed, cruelty, and misery on display. But that's the point. The actual masks in this episode represent the inner ugliness of each of the players. As his last act, Jason Foster exposes these unsavory people for what they truly are. And it becomes crystal clear why their punishment was at the top of his bucket list. And we're left to consider the aftermath. The masks is entertaining and engaging from start to finish. It's another easy one for me to recommend. I rate this one 5 out of 5 creepy masks. Thanks for watching everyone, feel free to let me know your thoughts on this one in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this review, hit that sub button, hit that like button, it helps the channel so much and I appreciate it. Be well, take care, later.